So thank you for allowing me to join your class. I appreciate the opportunity. Um, like Andrew said, I, I lived in Logan uh, for a while, for almost 10 years, working for Icon Health and Fitness. Uh, I started at Icon as a plastics engineer, uh, helping with treadmill engineering. Uh, but then they, in 2012, they bought the little shoe brand out of Orem, Utah, named Ultra. And at that time, it was super small. So we probably only had, you know, two or three styles. And um, they had had some sales. They had had, had some success uh, with their first few styles selling. But um, the founders, Golden Harper and Brian Beckstead, had essentially run out of money. So uh, they had lined up a, a meeting with Icon. Uh, and Icon was interested in purchasing the brand. So... So Icon bought the brand in 2012. Uh, I was working as a plastics engineer and, and I had the opportunity to move over and work in footwear. So at that time, I didn't know anything about footwear. You know, I didn't go to Utah State for their program of outdoor product design. You know, I hadn't been prepared in this world. So I kind of had to just learn on the fly. Um, we learned a lot from the factory. Uh, we learned a lot uh, by making mistakes. Uh, we you know, we would attend seminars and trainings and just try to catch up to what does it mean to be a product developer and uh, develop soft goods, develop footwear, um, you know, working with lasts, working with patterns, working with uh, design changes with the factory. And it's quite different from the, the plastics world, you know, developing footwear. Uh, it's a lot of sampling. It's a lot of uh, you know, trying to communicate the best you can to the factory and then having them come back with a first attempt at it that's usually disastrous. Um, and you got to hold their hand a little bit and say, okay, here's more what we were envisioning. And it's a lot of back and forth. And consequently, the development time for, for footwear is quite a bit longer uh, than a plastic product. So, but it, but it's super satisfying to see shoes that are out in the market that are being well received, uh, that people can wear to, to do their hobbies, to climb a mountain or to PR a marathon, and to hear that reaction from people that they really love their shoes. That's probably the biggest payoff of working for a brand like Ultra. Uh, so I've been in uh, Ultra on the Ultra team for about eight years. Um, mostly in development. So in the shoe making world, um, an engineer, a shoe engineer is not called a shoe engineer, it's called a developer. So I was, I was working as essentially a shoe engineer. So the designers would create the pretty pictures and then I would work with the factory in, you know, refining the pattern, working with materials, uh, modifying the construction, making sure it's comfortable, doing the wear testing, um, fit testing, making sure it's sized appropriately, and then ultimately signing off on the construction of the shoe, what we call a golden sample that, you know, it has my signature on it. They would take it to the production line. And if their production didn't match that golden sample, then it's on them. You know, we don't have to pay for faulty samples at that point. So that was kind of my job as a developer for uh, three or four years. Um, and then our brand got bought out, as you know, by VF Corp. So if you don't know anything about VF Corp, um, they are the parent company to Vans, the North Face, Timberland, Smart Wool, Jansport, um, a bunch of other outdoor brands, uh, Dickies, uh, Eagle Creek. Um, so they're pretty large company. Um, and so, and Ultra is a pretty small company. So you look at a, a brand like Vans, who's about 4 billion a year and compare that to little Ultra, who's maybe 60 million a year. It's a drip in the bucket, right? But VF Corp sees potential in us to keep growing, um, which we're excited to be a part of the VF family. And they've established a new headquarters uh, in Denver so we're now in the same building as all of the North Face crew, as well as Jansport, Smartwool, Eagle Creek. So got a great new building that they've renovated downtown. So my job now has 
has changed a bit um, as the team is growing more. Um, a lot of shoe brands will have an innovation uh, team, or maybe some people call it like a Skunk Works team or, a, or an innovation lab. So our innovation team consists of just a couple of guys, myself, we have a testing engineer out of New Hampshire and one of our designers, Steve Shorten, um, who's worked a little bit with this um, USU uh, department. I, he was an instructor here a couple of years ago, I think. Uh, anyway, so we're, I, I've been working primarily with innovation and also sustainability. So a lot of brands will have a, a whole innovation team and a sustainability team uh, and then a kind of a third branch of my responsibilities is 3D. So trying to evolve our development process to become more digital, uh, reduce the waste, um, get sampling more accurate and get sampling to, to occur quicker. So those are the kind of the three branches of my job. Um, and what I've prepared for you guys today is uh, a little bit more of a discussion on the sustainability aspect. Uh, Chase had asked me to prepare some slides around sustainability and the circular economy. And I just want to start out by saying that you guys are in a great position right now as you're entering the industry. Uh, you know, a, a lot of people in the industry are, you know, if they're from the older generation who they like to make messes, but they don't like to clean them up, uh, you guys are in a great position to come come to the market with solutions that don't add to the problem. You can come up with solutions that help uh, the environment, that help keep waste out of the landfills, um, and that really help to solve the problem instead of contribute to the problem. So I would view that more as a great opportunity rather than a, a requirement um, or a hoop that you have to jump through to sell product. Um, at the end of the day, you want to develop product that is meaningful um, and that helps leave the planet in a better place um, and that really improves lives, not just, I want to make a quick buck, right? And our consumers now are changing their mindset. It's not all about just price and it's not all about just performance anymore like it used to be, uh, especially the younger demographic like, like, your, like you guys, uh, Gen Z, is now making purchases based on, okay, I need performance and I need the good price, but I also need to purchase from a brand who's doing the right thing, who uh, respects my values and who uh, can show that they're a responsible company. And I don't wanna contribute to harming the environment by this purchase. I'll try not to be too boring. I know how it is on an early morning class uh, I was in college not too long ago, and I remember presentations from people where I was half asleep. So, uh, but I think this stuff is pretty interesting. Um, you know, the world is changing. Uh, if you look at where we were 100 years ago and where we are now, it's pretty sad. You know, you see this image on the right of just disgusting trash and garbage just in the ocean and and that's just a small sample of what's around us in the whole world, in the air. Um, like it says, our planet is reaching environmental overload. And at some point we have to start to change the way we do things, right? The plastic bottle idea has to change. I sure hope you guys on campus are not using plastic bottles. I hope you, I hope you use your reusable, washable Nalgene bottle instead of throwing away plastic bottles. And if you do have plastic bottles that you at least recycle them. So what is happening today and why? Um, United Nations here has said that uh, we really only have until 2030 to stem the effects of climate change. Uh, as, as we've seen wildfires, floods, hurricanes, a lot of these uh, dramatic weather events are related to global warming. The last 22 years have been the warmest years on record, according to the World Meteorologi Meteorological Organization. And the apparel industry is the second biggest polluter in the world. Uh, think about that for a second. 
the apparel industry. There's a lot bigger industries than the apparel industry. And you think about transportation sector and some of the others. Uh, but when you think about fast fashion and you think about how much consumption we do as a, as a people, we're, we're constantly buying the newest trends, the newest fashions. And what do we do with the old stuff, right? We either donate it or we just throw it away. Uh, we throw away 26 billion pounds of clothing into the landfill every year. And a lot of that is polyester or, or plastic based um, that uh, it doesn't go away in, in the landfill. Uh, from a trend perspective, they're expecting the sharing economy to grow. So instead of us constantly buying new, 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 um, there's going to be this idea of I'm just going to borrow it or I'm going to rent it and give it back so that I don't have to uh, have this overconsumption. Um, you think about the, on the, the right side there, the why, the number three I think is interesting. The rise of the gig or the access economy, whatever we want is on demand. Think about Amazon Prime, right? If I have a, a, a desire to buy something right now in the next five minutes, I can and it'll be here tomorrow. So that's something that didn't really exist, you know, think about it, 30, 40, 50 years ago, if you wanted to buy something, you got to make a trip into town, walk around the store, find exactly the thing you need, and then drive home. Uh, so consumers, this, this overconsumption idea fueled by e-commerce, Amazon, Walmart.com, call it whatever you want. I can have whatever I want instantly, can get out of control easily. So a lot is coming from that. Uh, um, companies are showing that they need to be more responsible in producing products that don't harm the environment. Um, transparency is a big deal with companies. So showing the customer where the products come from, where they're sourced and what goes into making them. Uh, disclosing where your factories are, disclosing how many workers are in your factories. Um, if you have a second, go to Everlane, um, com, I think Everlane is very good with transparency showing exactly how much they're paying for product. They show where all their factories are. They show how many workers are in their factories. They do even little bios on some of the workers. So people can see, Oh, I know that this garment that I'm buying is not being produced by underage labor, uh, you know, in, in poor conditions. Um, in Thailand, uh, they show exactly where it's coming from. They know customers now want to want to be sure they're not being taken advantage of monetarily. So they show exactly how much they're paying for it and how much you as a consumer are paying and what the markup is. And then lastly, the Marie Kondo effect, uh, this desire to let's just stop the overconsumption, right? Let's simplify our lives. We don't have to have, um, you know, the, the big house with three cars and a boat and a motor home and a huge wardrobe of clothes. Uh, the, the mini, the miniature house communities that are popping up, I think are really interesting uh, because people find this need um, to simplify both, both from a mental health standpoint and uh, just a waste reduction standpoint. Um, it's, it's a little bit freeing on the mind to just, let, I think we can do with less, right? And then uh, by doing with less and simplifying your life, you're not contributing to the overconsumption that's harming the environment. Only 9% of the world's plastics is recycled. I think a, a lot of us that um, have grown up with uh, one of those blue recycling bins, we kind of have this idea that yeah, it's, it's okay to have a plastic bottle because it'll just be recycled, no big deal. Um, but when you look at the statistics, how much of that is actually making its way to a recycling center? Um, probably not a lot. Um, those of you who are from California, surfer, surfer dudes, I'm sure you can relate to occasionally having to surf with gross plastic garbage <laughs> hopefully hopefully that is not in our future and we can stop 
stop this overconsumption and, and plastics problem. So there are some shifts in the trends uh, that are related to this global warming. Um, from no brainer to second thoughts, people, as the air pollution gets worse, you know, people may start to reconsider hiking, uh, camping, you know, being being in the outdoors, especially in bigger cities. How sad is that? That uh, what was once a healthy activity of getting outside and going for a walk may not be so healthy when you consider the air quality. Uh, things are changing. Uh, the, the world of fashion is moving to more of uh, uh, reusing parts, reusing components or materials. Uh, as you can see from the Nike regrind project there, um, as a nod to a uh, sort of self-expression and sustainability. Uh, people are renting clothing for events. So if you have like a, a wedding or something coming up and you need a nice dress, instead of buying it, a lot of the, the market is now leaning towards just renting it. Um, from linear to circular. Uh, the circular economy is kind of how do we keep things out of the landfill, right? And so you, as we move into the future, you'll see more of this idea of circularity of uh, the products we buy can be uh, disassembled and uh, put back into the supply chain to be reused and, and remade into new products. And then lastly, the, the companies are being held responsible to uh, not only stop harming the environment, but you need to be providing some good. Uh, you need to be helping in some way. Uh, and I feel like that's something VF does really well. Uh, VF Corporation is a huge corporation. You think about all of the materials that they purchased by way of, you know, the amount of polyester they buy, the amount of rubber they buy, EVA. You know, you could really fault them for you know, your company is really harming the environment because of all this stuff you guys are creating that ends up eventually going into the landfill. Well, they view it differently. They view it as our company is as big as it is, can be a real force for good. And we want to be a force for good in, um, you know, sourcing materials that are more sustainable, uh, sourcing from Farmers who can promote regenerative farming practices, uh, you know, who avoid deforestation uh, instead of sourcing, uh, you know, traditional uh, rubber from petroleum based substances, we can source natural rubber from regenerative rubber trees and make sure that those trees are are being harvested in a responsible way. Um, we hold our factories in Asia to an extremely high standard for worker treatment and making sure that the workers have, have rights, that they're not being uh, forced to work you know, too many hours. And when they are forced to work longer hours, that they're pay, being paid double for that time, that they have access to healthcare. Um, all of those things are things that a large corporation can do with their size to sort of force good things to happen. Um, they set a, a bold goal, VF has, by 2030, we want 100% of our top nine materials to be regenerative, res responsibly sourced, renewable, or recycled, which I think is an awesome, bold goal. So we really wanna reduce our impact on the environment. And you think about all those materials that we buy to make band shoes, to make North Face backpacks, all of those are gonna start coming from renewable or regenerative sources or recycled. So pretty cool. We're not the only ones in the industry that are trying to change the way we're looking at this, uh, at product creation. Um, as you know, Adidas Parlay project, pulling plastic water bottles out of the ocean and, and incorporating them into their footwear. Uh, Nike made a bold goal of 100% renewable energy. Volkswagen, uh, no combustion engines after 2026. Think about that, that's crazy. It seems like the automotive world has always been combustion engines and they've made a commitment, hey, enough is enough. Like that we realize this is our business, but it is not sustainable and it's going to harm the environment. So we're gonna draw a line in the sand and say no more combustion engines and let's start migrating over to electric. 
for the good of the environment. UK, eliminate avoidable plastic waste. Just recently, within the past week, um, ON has uh, launched uh, this new Cyclon shoe, which is a subscription-based recyclable running initiative. So the subscription-based kind of encourages people to actually send it back. It's like that uh, recycled water bottle idea. How do we know that the water bottles are actually being recycled? Well, with a subscription-based model like this, they know that these shoes are going to come back because the customer isn't going to get another one until they send it back. So that ensures that all of these recyclable shoes are coming back to them and they have a way of uh, forming all of that product, that, all that material, that raw material that's coming back, using that to create more product. So that's kind of really the crux of this circularity concept is how can we keep things out of the landfill and design product in a way that, uh, you know, helps um, be more environmentally friendly, but we create this closed loop of uh, get acquiring material, using the material, and then recycling that same material back into the same loop to make more product. And that's really the goal. That's like the, the golden chalice of what product designers can do. If they're able to pull this off, that'll have a huge impact on the environment and really start, hopefully start a trend in, in the industry where more companies will start doing uh, similar things. Solomon, of course, same kind of thing, uh, although their take on it is a little bit different where they would take the shoes back and turn them into ski boots. Apparently they've engineered a way to do that. As a product designer and developer, uh, you guys need to think about, you know, what kinds of things your consumer values and how do you connect to that consumer on those things that they value. So if you're if you're designing a you know a trekking pole or a hiking boot, you can assume that they love outdoors, they love clean air, they love clean trails. So you creating some kind of sustainability aspect to your product, it's really going to connect to that consumer on a deep level because you're helping them enjoy the outdoors for for longer, right? You're helping them enjoy their hobby with clean air and they'll appreciate that you're doing the right thing uh, as a brand, as a company. Our mission statement uh, for Ultra is unleashing human potential by inspiring the world to move naturally. So if you know anything about Ultra, Ultra was pretty famous for coining this idea of zero drop. So zero drop means the heel is not higher than the forefoot. So we feel like that's a natural foundation. So again, that word natural, our, our toes splay out in ultra shoes. We don't want to create a pointy toe box that's a, an unnatural platform for running. So again, that word natural. So when we talk about ultra and sustainability, we really wanna hone in on this word natural. We inspire the world to move naturally and we also inspire them to choose a more natural and sustainable path. The last few slides are really great information I was able to find on just options. You as a designer have lots of options for materials that you can use in your product. So I would just encourage you if you're, you know, if you're designing a backpack or you're designing uh, ski poles or a ski boot or, or whatever it is you're designing, think about just beyond, okay, I want to think about beyond the traditional, you know, TPU, polyester, rubber, EVA, what are the alternatives? What else can I use to tell a little bit more of a regenerative or sustainable story? Uh, there's some brands out there that are doing some really cool, amazing things. Um, I mean, think about it, building uh, leather-like upper material out of pineapple, that's awesome. And to be able to tell that story to your consumer that not only are you being innovative, but you're choosing materials that are completely um, renewable. Gives you great marketing content, uh, but also gives you kind of that street cred in the minds of the consumer that you're a company that's wanting to do the right thing. Um, so anyway, you're recording this presentation so you guys can read through this uh, list of material options at a later time. but. Um, I'll just keep things moving a little bit. Um, 
just finishing up with, I thought this cartoon was funny. Uh, regardless of your politics, even if you feel like global warming is a, is a political thing, it's not real. You know, you hear the, the argument that global warming is just a natural part of the earth's cycle. And that may be so, but I, I think this guy's comment at the climate summit is funny. What if it's a big hoax and we create a better world for nothing? Um, energy independence, preserving rainforests, green jobs, renewables, clean air, healthy children. Like this is all good things that we're doing. So I think it, it's important to get outside the politics and just start thinking about doing the right thing, right? Uh, not depleting the resources of our earth and trying to use more renewable, sustainable materials, uh, being more of a responsible uh, designer, being more of a responsible corporation uh, is the goal. So that's it. So I guess we'll um, turn the time over to any questions or if there's any comments people have that they want to share. Um, we can transition to that. Yeah, so I can read some of those. We had a few come in throughout the presentation, um, so keep those coming as, as you're thinking of those. But um, the first one was for a brand that's that uh, for a brand that's just starting um, that doesn't have a lot of means for development, very low budget to meet high minimums. What can be done to try and be or try and achieve uh, a more sustainable product or sustainable company? Great question. And that's actually, that's ultra because we don't have big budgets. We're still a fairly small brand and there's a lot of focus from BF on hitting our, our profit margin numbers. And it's, it's sad because the hard reality is that these sustainable materials are more expensive. So you really have to prioritize the story you're telling. Um, are you telling a hundred percent pure performance story? or is there room in your storytelling for some sustainability in it? And how much is your consumer willing to spend for that added sustainability? Um, the hard reality is that sometimes the consumer is not willing to spend anything extra to get a sustainable story in the product, right? So as a designer, you can be creative in finding uh, material sources that are not more expensive. You can find recycled polyesters that aren't more expensive than just standard polyester. Uh, our supply chain is getting to a point now where these materials are more prevalent and easily accessible. So even if the only thing you can do is, you know, 10% recycled polyester, that's better than nothing. And, you know, we can slowly move, uh, and make progress in this space without having to do a, a complete 100% recyclable shoe, you know, like what Solomon did. Even just doing a little bit is better than nothing. So I guess that would be my advice is uh, do the best you can to, to source uh, recyclable or, or renewable materials and still hit the price target that you have to hit. So the next question, how does it work being under a larger corporation? Uh, you mentioned that Altra is now in the same building as other companies, but um, how does it affect how the company runs, policies, guidelines, um, et cetera? It's been interesting because, you know, you might think that Altra is in competition with the North Face in trail running or hiking product, but they've actually been really good about creating this idea of, they call it 1VF. So we wanna act as a family, we wanna act as a team, and we wanna help each other accomplish our goals. So, um, but VF is very good about uh, wanting to preserve the company culture that each brand has. So they're not gonna force the Vans culture on everybody. They're not gonna force the, the North Face culture on everybody. We can have our own ultra culture, but still benefit from the purchasing power of VF and some of the resources on you know, factory sourcing and supply chain and inventory management and all of this capital that they have to invest in our brand. Uh, those are all great resources. And being in the same building as, you know, the North Face designers, we really learn a lot from them. And those are accomplished, smart guys. And they've been around the block with products that they've done. And they've been actually really, really good about 
uh, being willing to mentor us and to help us out. And if there's any a time, ever a time when we have a question about something, I can just walk down the hall to the North Face developers and, and ask them a question and they'll answer it straight up. Um, so it's not compartmentalized at all. Uh, we view ourselves as a big family and we help each other out and we cheer for each other when we all have uh, big wins. Uh, we don't feel like we're competing with each other at all. Great. So this next question, um, I got into a minimalist, or I got into minimalist shoes when I had a bout of plantar uh, fasciitis. So I like where Ultra is going, but you seem along the lines of Merrill and the New Balance Minimus. Um, I have two questions. How do you differentiate your shoes from the quote unquote big players in the market? Second, how do you get into the heads and feet of your prospective customers? Uh, what have you found out through, through that experience? Yeah, good question. Um, so even though our company was founded during the height of the minimalist movement, we really don't view ourselves as a minimalist brand. Um, just putting the heel and the forefoot on the same plane doesn't necessarily make it minimal because we have thick shoes as well. Our Olympus is 36 millimeters of foam underfoot, which is a big old chunk of foam. Um, but we want to put the foot in a natural position, which which doesn't elevate the heel. And we want to encourage really good blood flow to the toes. So we allow those toes to splay out. So I think that's the biggest differentiator between us and the competition uh, is that wide toe box and zero drop platform is just a healthier, more natural position for your feet to run in. And if you think about a marathoner, they have to run 26 miles. They're more concerned about comfort than they are fashion, right? They don't care if people are looking at them saying, ooh, that toe box looks a little wide. I'm gonna judge you, right? They're like, no, I wanna PR my marathon. I want my toes to be comfortable. And I, want, I don't want my feet to be hurting at the end of this race. So our brand has always prioritized function over fashion. Uh, so I would say that's the biggest differentiator. But where we really win is when people actually try the shoes on, uh, they just feel like bedroom slippers. They are so comfortable and different than any other running shoe you've ever tried. So I'll just put in that plug for our brand. If you've never tried Ultra, uh, go try them out. I think you'll love it. Great. Um, what, what's, your, uh, what's the development time of an Ultra shoe and what has been your favorite project while working at Ultra? Development time, we start about 18 months in advance. And actually now that VF has acquired us, we're starting to do some of the preliminary trend research up to two years in advance. And that gets a little bit of a double-edged sword because it's hard to know exactly what the market is going to want. You don't know the trends in the market just you know that far in advance. So you're kind of just making your best guess as to what's going to be wanted in the marketplace and how the current shoe that you're developing is going to perform. Uh, you know, right now we're working on fall, winter 22, and we're just sitting in 2020 right now. So it's kind of mind blowing to people who aren't used to that kind of um, development time, that lead time of having to work so far in advance. Um, probably my favorite project uh, that I worked on, um, gosh, that's a great question because there's been so many good ones. I've really liked the Paradigm shoe. So our, the Paradigm is a little bit higher stack height running shoe. And me personally, I have pretty rigid arches. I have high arches, but they're really rigid. And so um, I tend to have some foot problems and some IT band problems because of my inflexible feet. Um, but that higher stack height shoe, the Paradigm really helps me with my running uh, and helps me stay injury free. So. And we've won some really good awards with that shoe in the past. So I, I love being a part of the design and development of a shoe that I then can use personally for my running. Uh, this is the last question that we have here, so, but I think we've got time for some more if, if anyone else wants to drop a question in. But um, this is a big question. How does recycling apparel work? Who pays for that? Do companies have to pay factories to recycle materials? Are there nonprofit factories that recycle? If companies have to pay for recycling, that seems like it would um, deter them. So kind of a big question just about the cycling uh, or 
recycling industry? Yeah, so great question. And there is some infrastructure that has to be put into place for that collection of the apparel back, right? So, you know, when you talk about supply chain and you talk about materials acquisition from all of the material suppliers, they have a system that's set up in place with warehousing and shipping to get all of the, you know, thousands and thousands of tons of fabric to the, the assembly factory where they cut it, they sew it, they assemble it into uh, shipments and they ship it out. So what we're talking about is what, how do we do the reverse of that? How do we get in product that's been used? How do we sort it? How do we cut it apart? How do we grind it up into material that is then uh, that you can then use again? It's not easy, right? And it, it takes a lot of effort. There is some cost there, but I would say that there is some cost savings in not having to pay for virgin material. All of that is free, essentially free material that you're getting that you can use in product. So essentially the only thing you're paying for is the processing of that. Um, so I think the industry is still trying to juggle this um, problem because it's not an easy problem. Uh, how do we collect the material? How do we filter it? How do we process it? How do we reincorporate? Um, and then it makes it hard when there are blends like a polyester cotton blend that can be hard to reuse into something else. Um, when there are components, you know, zippers and buttons, all of those have to be removed somehow. Um, so it's not easy, but I'm sure as, you know, people are problem solvers. And as we continue to move towards wanting to close the loop with circularity, the solutions will come, the infrastructure will come, and we, we will find a way as an industry to make that happen. I think we'll just take the last couple questions that are here uh, that have been shared. But um, this question is, I think a lot of, of people want to move in a more sustainable direction when it comes to purchasing. However, sustainable products tend to be more expensive. How can we as designers and developers make affordable, sustainable products so we can reach a broader audience? Great question uh, again. Um, you just have to prioritize the whistles and bells that you're putting on your product, right? So if I want to use this amazing uh, recycled nylon and pineapple upper and hemp, you know, I've got all these great sustainable materials that I want to use. You might not be able to afford boa lacing and Vibram outsole and all these other whistles and bells um, that you might ordinarily put in there. So I would say um, it's all about the story you're telling. Um, Alter shoes used to be fairly complex in their construction. And one thing we've learned is that that isn't always necessary. Um, you know, you think about the layering the, and the, all the materials that go into putting a shoe together. Hoka has been really good about creating just simple designs, a simple upper that's not, you know it's not overly complex if you can simplify the design and simplify the number of components that have to go into it hopefully that saves you some money that then you can invest in more sustainable materials and then you're telling a story more along the lines of this is a sustainable shoe rather than uh you know this shoe has all these name brand components the ortholite the vibram the boa lacing the, all of those which are expensive Hey, so a follow-up question um, to a previous question. I'm still wondering about getting into the minds of your customers. How do you find out what they're looking for? Um, so they have, they have whole teams of people that do this, consumer insights studies, and there are um, su subscription services you can pay for or trend groups that do this kind of research. Uh, NPD. I don't know if you guys follow Matt Powell. Matt Powell is a great industry resource for studying where are the trends going, what are consumers wanting, what are they asking for. Um, just trying to dive into those special interest groups, um, Facebook groups, um, running clubs, whatever it is that, that your product is, there will inevitably be discussions that happen within those groups whether it's chats, whether it's blogs, whether it's news articles, 
um, the, the trends happen kind of organically and, and you have to be really tapped into what the conversations are in your particular category so that you can pick up on these trends, what people are needing. Um, you can also do catered studies. You know, if you want to do a little bit more of a specific study, you could, you could pull together people from industry and say, hey, uh, you're an influencer in this industry. I want to have you do a, a test for us, a product test. We want to get your opinion on performance of hiking boots or racing shoes or whatever it is you're making. And you can kind of create that research on your own by getting that feedback. And then when you include that research in your product launch, you can say, here's our story. We're coming to market with ABC. And here's why we know this is an issue because we've talked to this person who is a major influencer. We've talked to this person who's PR'd multiple events and, and this person who's been an athlete for 35 years. And here's what they're saying. And the consumer will say, oh, okay, yeah, that's what I want too, because they identify with those major influencers as kind of being representatives of their uh, market. So hopefully that's helpful. So I think we're gonna have to cut off after this, this question. Uh, these have all been really great questions. So thanks everyone for, for uh, you know, writing those in. This is kind of more of a personal question. What did you do for school? And then how did you, um, you kind of shared how you ended up at Ultra, but I guess what, um, how did you gravitate towards Ultra and maybe what have you liked about being there? Uh, so in school, I actually studied technology education. I thought I wanted to be a drafting teacher uh, just because I loved drafting in high school. Uh, but the drafting world changed pretty rapidly. They went from drawing things manually on the board with drawing tools to everything's on the computer with AutoCAD and SolidWorks. So in college, uh, I was doing a lot of my CAD work and drafting work uh, in SolidWorks. And so even though I graduated with this idea of teaching drafting, because I had developed these skills using a 3D CAD system, I got a job offer right out of college to just be a CAD guy, SolidWorks guy, and made probably triple what I would have made as a teacher. Granted, teachers don't teach for the money, but um, when you're a young, uh, young married couple with a couple kids and the, the bills start coming, uh, it was nice to have a little bit higher paycheck uh, doing 3D CAD. And then the, doing the 3D CAD kind of evolved itself into uh, mechanical drafting and mechanical engineering. I didn't have a mechanical engineering degree, but I was doing essentially mechanical engineering work for ICON, doing the plastics engineering. And then it was just kind of a coincidence that Icon purchased this shoe brand and I ended up going into footwear. Uh, you know, I didn't plan to go into footwear. Uh, my career just kind of went that way organically. And I think you guys will find that your, your career may not necessarily follow the path that you lay out, that your intentions kind of show that uh, opportunities will come, you know, and, and it's not that uncommon for people to get a degree in one thing and end up working in something completely different. In fact, I think there are very few people in the footwear industry that studied footwear. Like you can't really go to college and study footwear, right? You kind of have to get into the industry some other way, uh, unless you go to Utah state and you do the outdoor product design program, then you can study footwear. Uh, but yeah, so I got into footwear kind of through that, through that way, um, through just being a part of Icon. And it's been great. I've learned a lot of footwear, about footwear. And I guess I was interested in accepting that position because I've always, I've always liked shoes. Uh, I've been a big basketball guy my whole life. And I've been kind of a shoe dog looking at the next, you know, the next Jordans, the next LeBrons, the next KDs. Um, and I've always been fascinated by their use of materials in an artistic way to be both functional and beautiful. So when the opportunity to came, came to me to work in footwear and do that same thing, I just jumped at the chance. We really appreciate you taking some time out of your day to talk to us. I appreciate it. Appreciate the opportunity.